Welcome back. Silver and Black today in Odyssey Sports original podcast. Also heard on the radio in Las Vegas, Nevada on 101.5 FM. K-Don and sister station 98.5 The Bet in Las Vegas. Odyssey stations, both of them, of course. Scott Branson, along with my partner Mo Moten. Here to talk about Raiders football. Of course, the Raiders coming up against the Carolina Panthers Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at Allegiant Stadium, the home opener just after one o'clock in the afternoon Pacific time. Thanks for being with us. Do us a favor. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, please do so wherever you get your audio. Please rate and review it as well. If you're watching us on video, please subscribe and you know rate, give a thumbs up and hit that notifications bell on YouTube. That way, every time we have a new video, we don't just have the shows on video. We have all kinds of different videos. Make sure you check that out wherever you watch your videos. You should find us there as well. Again, Scott and Mo with you. Mo is the senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report. And you can also find his work on the Raiders, where he's a columnist at sportsnot.com. You can also find my work as well as uh, following us. We love to interact with all of you out there. On X.com, Mo is Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N, and I am at L-V Gully. The show is S-N-B Today. All right, Mo, here we are. We're uh, getting closer. We're inching up to this home opener for the Raiders, coming off the emotional come-from-behind win against the Baltimore Ravens. This Raiders team is going to come into this game at Allegiant Stadium full of confidence, still have things to work on, But uh, I can't imagine this is a very important stretch, I think, for this team. If you look at who their opponents are over the next few weeks, Uh, you talked about it on Tuesday on the show, Mo, talking about, hey, this team could might be four and one. I think when we did our record predictions, we had them. I had them at three and two. You had them at four and one. And of course, uh, that that loss against Baltimore was one that we thought both would happen. That's where we had commonalities. But you look at this team heading into the game down at Allegiant Stadium. Uh, I think this is a this is a good week for the Raiders to build on what happened in the fourth quarter, especially offensively in Baltimore. Absolutely, pass first, run second. I guess <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna have I have an article up on Sportsnet that talks about something has to change with the Raiders' run scheme. Uh, the, if they're gonna now, it's fine if you recognize who your playmakers are. And it shouldn't be hard to figure out Devontae Adams, Brock Bowers are your guys. But eventually, as I said on Tuesday, you're gonna have to get the run game going because you're gonna need some balance, some type of balance, whether it's getting the run game going or the short passing game. And based on Antonio Pierce's comments on Monday's presser, it seems like he's willing to change the scheme to fit Zamir White, who is, as he says, the lead running back. He says he's going to, as long as he's the head coach there, that Zamir White is going to be the guy and he's going to feed him the football. So uh, the Raiders may have to do a little less or a bit less or moderately less zone blocking, uh, zone run blocking, and and more uh, gap scheme because Zamir White's a downhill uh, runner. And uh, this is probably why they brought in Alexander Madison uh, coming from the Minnesota Vikings, can run in that zone blocking system. So if they're going to get Zamir White going, they have to do what worked for him at the end of last year, those last four weeks, and that's gap schemes. Um, so we'll see if that changes. If if the scheme doesn't change, the RB1 must change. One of those things has to change uh, in this upcoming game against the Panthers. Right. They need to establish some sort of running game. It doesn't have to be the best in the league. Like you said, if the pass is working, you obviously have weapons there. By the way, in the second segment, we're going to talk specifically about Brock Bowers and some high praise coming his way from all pros, Hall of Famers, future Hall of Famers, you name it. We'll talk about that in the second segment. But that offense, as you said, Mo, we want to see week-by-week improvement. Now, you didn't see it until the fourth quarter last week when they started rolling from that pass, but you mentioned changing the scheme for Zamir White from a running perspective. How much of that is, do we look at that as saying, well, here's Antonio Pierce is going to have to tell his offensive coordinator, his new offensive coordinator, Luke Getze, 
hey man, look, that's not working. So I know you got you make the call. You're the OC, but guess what we're doing? We're going to pass more and we're going to change the blocking scheme to better use this running back. Is that is that a rebuff of the offensive coordinator, or is that just part of normal NFL scheming? And when you see things work uh, and don't work, you kind of just adjust on the fly. It's a collaborative approach. I know Antonio Pierce is not an offensive minded head coach. It's how much is he behind Zamir White to tell his mm. offensive coordinator who's in control of the offense, look, you got to tweak some things to fit the RB1 that I want out there getting 20 plus or 15 to 20 uh, cat, uh, touches. So I, I think it with every team, we don't hear about it. And Tony Pierce, Pierce is very blunt. His pressers basically tells you exactly what is on his mind. Uh, but I think this happens, you know, across the board in the league where, but they may not, coaches may not talk about it publicly where they outwardly say we may need to change the scheme to fit a specific player. Yeah. And he's the CEO, right? We talk about that all the time. Some people laugh when we say CEO, but that's what he is. When you're the head coach, you're the head of the football side of the organization when it comes to the on the field team. And so you got to make those tough decisions sometimes. My question too, about you talk about scheme. We talk about Zamir White having to, to find it a little bit. Uh, especially in that scheme, because he's not a jump cut run runner like you saw from Josh Jacobs. He's not going to make a lot of the lateral move, and he's much more north south guy, which makes a lot of sense. But as you said earlier in the week, Antonio Pierce at the presser also discussed Mo the inability of the offensive line also to do things the way they need to do them. Um, the concerns, I mean, it's only two games in, so you don't have to get overly concerned, but clearly. Colton Miller struggled in the first two weeks, as has Thayer Munford Jr. on the right side. Andre Miller in the middle, even at center, has struggled at times. This unit, I've been preaching patience. I said it last show. We saw this, last, actually, the last two years with an offensive line, I think that wasn't as good, frankly, that, that you kind of have to gel into. You have to get things working, new quarterback, new system, all of that. If they now change that blocking scheme for the running game, does that add another wrinkle for this this offensive line to get on the same page? I wouldn't say so, simply because Andre James has been with the Raiders for a few years, mm -hmm. Colton Miller since 2018. Ben Mumford was there last year when Zamir White was going downhill. Again, those last four weeks of the season, you saw what Zamir White does best when he's going north-south. Ben Mumford was there. Colt Miller was hurt, but he was with the team. As I said, Andre James was there. D Dylan Parham was there, but he was just on the left side of the line. These, with the exception of Jackson Powers Johnson, I mean, these aren't totally new. I and mean, Cody Whitehair is used to Luke Getty's system from Chicago. Right. With those two being the exceptions at the guard position, all of these guys were there last year or for multiple years. So they're not new to a switch or lean toward more gap blocking so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a new wrinkle with the exception for maybe cody white hair and the rookie jackson powers johnson who hasn't gotten on the field yet yeah so it, it'll be interesting i think that that run game you have to get something going and this is the week to do it right because listen how good can they be at running the ball we don't know yet for all the reasons we've just discussed but you're going against a carolina team right that that has trouble all over the field offensive line defensive line defensive backfield you know they're they're struggling some of that I, I wrote a piece on sports not about bryce young and how actually it's it's the organization not just the quarterback it's a terrible organization the owner is a toxic dude it's just bad and so the raiders get to take advantage of that so that's why we talk about so much mo opportunity right so when you come out and i said it last last show no nfl team is just a walkover you can't just walk it's professional football at the same time the Raiders are presented with a great opportunity of playing at home against a team they should beat. And you have to, when you have those advantages, you have to take advantage of them and, and win those ball games. And not only win them, I think, I think for them too, they need to do it somewhat convincingly. I'm not saying they got to win by 30 points, but I think they need to come out and execute really, really crisply, really well, and sort of bring that confidence that they gained at the end of the Baltimore game back into this so they can carry it on into the middle of their schedule. One of the things, if you want to make that leap from being mediocre to a playoff team is you beat the teams that you are clearly better than, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not saying that the Raiders should blow out the Panthers, but look at the rosters. <laughs> I mean, I know Bryce <laughs> Young was benched for Andy Dalton and a lot of their offensive issues because Bryce Young was, I believe, under 56% completion rate. Uh, 
reportedly the receivers were frustrated with him. I understand all that, and Andy Dalton's going to boost that Panthers defense. But just look at the Panthers roster. They missed their best defensive lineman in Derrick Brown, who's their best run stopper, by the way. J.C. Horn still isn't, while he's healthy now, isn't playing at a tip-top level. He's allowing a, above a 104 passer rating in coverage right now. They don't have a lot of playmakers. Jadavion Clowney is not making a big impact. They have no guys on the roster with one full sack. The highest, the highest is, is a half. I think a couple of guys have a half sack. So their defense isn't good. Their secondary particularly isn't good. Uh, their run game, and now, and I know Bryce Young not being effective in the past game is a part of that, but their run game isn't isn't much effective. They drafted a guy, Jonathan uh, Jonathan Brooks, I believe, out of. Uh, in the second round, hasn't played because he's on the NFI list. He's recovering from a torn ACL. Chuba Hubbard hasn't been able to capture what he did at the end of last year running the football. Miles Sanders has been an afterthought. That Panthers offensive line isn't great. So collectively, the Raiders have a better team. They yeah. should, to me, that the, the line is about what five and a half, as you see on Bet US. Um, they should win by a touchdown or more, in my opinion, in their home opener. You would think so, and uh, that's right. We are showing you. If you're watching us, we're looking at uh, the the lines here, the spread at five and a half, as Mo said, from our good friends at BetUS, of course, a sponsor of the show, so thank you to them. So at, at five and a half, uh, money lines at minus 250, the total 40 and a half there for the Raiders. And yeah, I, I look, this is a game... I think the Raiders offense, even though it came alive at the end of the Baltimore game, this is the odds makers looking at it and saying, look, we're still not sold, right, Mo? Uh, because the Panthers are terrible. This is a home game for the Raiders. The Raiders defense, uh, it reflected there in the in the under, obviously, clearly has, has impressed people. But that offense still hasn't, you know, hasn't proven that it's going to play four quarters and execute that way. So I think that's a little bit of the line there. But yeah, this is, should be a game that the Raiders, I believe, win by two scores. Uh, clearly, the, the odds makers think that even if it's two by two kicks, I think it's going to be by a touchdown and a field goal or more than that. But the importance of them going out at home and establishing, too, this season – that home field advantage because you won't have a lot of Carolina Panthers fans on the road. So for those Raider and Raider nation concerned about the, the stadium being filled with blue and black, I don't think you're going to see that you're going to see black and silver. Uh, but uh, Mo, this to me is and just an important game to set the, the tone as they head down into the next several weeks. They got some beatable opponents, obviously Cleveland. We talked about that last time as well, but just, I think really important for this team to come out and execute well and do what they should do against the Panthers. I'm looking at that bet us uh, graphic there. And I, and I kind of like the total on the over here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. any Dalton coming in for Bryce young is going to, as I said, boost the Panthers offense. The Panthers are going to, I think, believe we're going to score some points. Not to say that the race defense isn't good, but I think the boost having him there with Adam Thielen, Deontay Johnson, Xavier Leggett getting that rookie going. I think the Panthers are going to score a bit, but I do think the Raiders get back and get back over 24 points again because the Panthers' defense is putrid. Gardner Mitch is going to have a lot of time to throw the football. Who's mm -hmm. going to stop Devontae Adams and Brock Burrows in that defense? I, I don't have any answers. I wouldn't be surprised. If the Raiders I, they don't have 20. the answer. If I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Raiders score 27 here, and I think I would comfortably take the over on that graphic slip. All right, we're going to take our first break here on Silver and Black today. When we come back, we're going to hear a little bit from some people you may know about Brock Bowers, his incredible start to his rookie season. For those naysayers who were upset that the Raiders took another tight end, I'm sure you're not feeling that way anymore. But we're going to get into that when we come back here on Silver and Black today. Of course, uh, shout out to our good friends from BetUS for bringing this to you on the video, especially. And then uh, for those of you who haven't already subscribed to the show, make sure you do so wherever you get your podcast. Mo and I are coming back right after these words. All right. Now it's time for us to put a little money where our mouth is. And of course, when we're going to bet football, where do we go? We go to BetUS, of course. Best payouts, great customer service there. No matter what you're looking to do, you're going to find it there at BetUS, especially when it comes to the NFL uh, and football. And Mo, we're going to look at the Raiders game here as soon as I can get into the football piece here. But this Raiders game, you mentioned it as we were talking during the segment about uh, the over under on this game at 40 and a half. I too am with you. I think this could be because of Andy Dalton. He's going to complete some passes. Bryce Young has struggled. But if you look at this, this game, I think it's going to go over that 40 and a half. Looks like it moved up to 41 now that we're live on BetUS. 
But let's talk about this. We go ahead. I heard my analysis bumped it up. <laughs> Your analysis bumped it up. All right. So here we are. We're on Bet US. You guys check it out. We're going to put our money where our mouth is here too. Mo, I mean, clearly we talked about the Raiders uh, winning this game, and I and I believe that fully. I'm putting fifty dollars on the Raiders uh, here at five and a half points. As you can see, I'm going to confirm that bet. See how easy it is on BetUS? It's so cool. But we're going to go back in, too, because we're going to look at some of the other bets here on this game. Now, we can go to the market section here. It's really easy to get on the website. You can see the game here. Everything you want to do, whether you want to bet halves, quarters, game props. The game props are up. Player props uh, are not full yet. They get a little closer as we get to closer to the weekend. But we can go back out and find out some of them. Oh, excuse me. And uh, Mo, I, tell me what, what player props you're looking at. I know we don't have any odds yet, but when you start looking at this game against the Panthers and, and Raiders, uh, I'm really interested in, in sort of what we, saw, what we saw last week, right, which was uh, some of the best talent on the Raiders getting the ball. So Devontae Adams, Brock Bowers, anything there appealing to you uh, so far from what you've seen? Being that the player props are not up yet, I want to see what – the I want to see what Brock Bowers props are. I want to see mm-hmm. if the market has adjusted to Brock Bowers, who's been, you know, the best rookie in my <laughs> opinion in his class so far. I know the Chargers fans will probably say Joe Alt because of the way they're running the football, but Brock Bowers, uh, what he's done for that Raiders offense when it was stagnant, can't be understated. I'm willing to see what the I want to see what the market, how the market adjusts to his production. I'm also I also want to see what Zamir White's rushing yards line will be mm. because you mentioned it a bit. The Panthers are allowing 200 yard rushing yards per game between the Saints, between that loss of the Saints and the Chargers. 200, I think it's 199 <laughs> rushing yards averaging in those two games allowed. Right? I just mentioned it. Derek Brown is not playing their best defensive lineman. This is the game where the Raiders can get their run game right. I tweeted about it. Whether it's Mayor White or Alexander Madison or a combination of both, I want to see both their lines because I think I would take the over on Zamir White's rushing, assuming they stick to Antonio Pierce's word and they feed him the football. Yeah, and and I just I just made a bet. The only props we we have up so far from a player perspective as we're recording this is uh, Brock Bowers one plus touchdowns or two plus touchdowns, and I just put twenty bucks on on Brock Bowers with one. I, I for some reason I feel like. I feel like he's going to score this week. I, I, I call me crazy. I think the Raiders are going to get more into the red zone there too. So, I, so I've done that. I've placed that bet as you can see uh, right there, successful at plus three fifty nine. So we'll see. Hey, look, I'm with you too on the Zamir White. I think Zamir White gets a little uncorked this week. Um, but Mo, when you look at this game, uh, we talked about the points. What else? At forty one, you're still liking the over. Should I, you, you want me to put some money behind what you're saying here, Mo? Did you already put money on it? I, I, I hate the line, but I, here's the over under. I like the over as I, well. I, I still like the over simply because even if the Panthers offense is still putrid, I do think the Raiders are going to have an offensive outburst because, as I said, the Pan, the Panthers don't really have an answer on their defense for Brock Bowers or Devonta Adams. I can see both guys getting close to 100 receiving yards. Yes. I can see both guys getting into the end zone. Yes, uh, so, absolutely. You know, I, I think this is the game. If the Raiders are going to have an offensive outburst go before they face the Cleveland Browns who have a much tougher defense, this is the game where they can have an even bigger momentum swing, carry that momentum that they had out of the Baltimore game in the, in the third, fourth quarter into a team that, in my opinion, has the worst defense in the league. <laughs> I mean, if you can't score 24 against the Panthers, then you've got some serious issues, regardless of what you did the previous week. Right. Okay. So you can see I just made that bet there too for the over 41. It's up to 41 now. So I put another 50 there as well. So we'll see how we do on that. Now, Mo, I want to do a quick, we're going to do a quick parlay here. Of course, tonight is the Patriots and Jets. What are you thinking of? You're in New York. You know, the Aaron Rodgers back at MetLife for the first time since the injury. The Patriots, who everyone thought was going to be the worst team in football, have actually played pretty well. And so this Jets team always seems like it's going to disappoint. What do you think happens in the game tonight? I actually think the Jets are going to win, but I do think the Patriots are going to cover. Six mm-hmm. points is a big line. Last week in week two, six of the biggest underdogs covered. Yes. Including the Raiders were the biggest of those underdogs. But 
as you said, the Patriots are playing better than a lot of people expect this because they have an identity that they're running the football pretty well with Ramondre Stevenson. And I think when you run the football like that and you play good defense, you shorten the football game, it makes those margins a lot smaller. So for me, six points is a lot considering the Jets offense. While while they did beat the Titans, the Jets offense isn't lighting teams up. Yes. I mean, it's they're not scoring 30 points a game. They put up 24 against the Titans. And you saw what happened on Monday Night Football against the 49ers. They struggled for most of that game. They had a garbage time TD with Tyron Taylor. And but I, I think this is going to be closer than six points. So I would I definitely think the Jets are going to win, but I also would take the Patriots to cover that plus six. Yeah, and I was thinking about the 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 under there because I just the, the offenses for both these teams just don't really impress me until we see Aaron Rodgers maybe get into a rhythm. But I'm staying away from it. You can see I, I I'm with you. I really like that plus six with the Patriots. So I just bet that on bet us. So there you go. We've got some live bets with you and we remind you go check out our good friends with bet us because uh, I'll tell you what we've, we've done a lot of uh, sports betting and there's just nobody better. And, and we've been very, very happy with our accounts there. And I would, ex- it would, it would uh, invite you to do that by the way, guess what? Check this out. 150% sign up bonus. You just use the promo code YouTube 150. Start playing today with this exclusive offer. And you get that bonus for a sign up. So you haven't already signed up with Mo and I for Bet US, is where we exclusively bet our stuff. Make sure you do that. The YouTube code is YouTube150. Excuse me, the promo code is YouTube150. So there you go. Thanks again to Bet US for their sponsorship and uh, and their partnership here with us. So there you go. All right, it's time for the segment number two. Welcome back to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast, also heard on the radio in Las Vegas on 101.5 FM, KDON, and 90, excuse me, 89.5, the bet in Las Vegas as well. Mo Moten, Scott Colbranson back with you. We are talking Raiders football, and we're going to specifically talk about one Raider to start out this segment, and that is Brock Bowers. We talked a little bit about him in the first uh, first half of the show. Mo, we talked on – still, I still get clips sent to me of our reaction to the Raiders drafting Brock Bowers because <laughs> it was just such a surprise. Not, 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 a bad, not a bad surprise. We just thought it was going to be an offensive lineman. And a lot of people still, up until week one and even into week two, were sort of like, man, we really need that offensive lineman. See, we should have taken Brock Bowers. He was a reach pick, even though I don't know how you can call this kid a reach pick. But nonetheless, he comes out and, and goes nuts – again, in front of the audience there in Baltimore against a very good defense, and he's getting high praise. We'll go through the numbers in a minute, but on FanDuel TV uh, with Kay Adams on Up and Adams, or I think it's called Up and Adams. I think that's what it's called. Uh, Devontae Adams was on, right, Mo? And he was on with a one Mr. Rob Gronkowski, who I think knows a little bit about playing tight end in the NFL. Here's what they had to say. I want to. I want you guys to hear this, and then we'll come back and talk about it. It's about a minute long. So here is Kay Adams with Devontae Adams, no relation, and, of course, Rob Gronkowski. Keep seeing how amazing he is out there. He had another big week helping you out. Nine grabs, 98 yards. Yeah. I would love to hear from both of you, Devontae, and just like, you know, you just don't see that from rookies in this league. Well, I don't, I don't ever like to put any expectation on a young player, but, I mean, the, the type, of, type of kid that he is, I mean, he literally only cares about football. And he shows some promise of looking like this guy that's, that's on the screen with us right now. Honestly, I don't, I don't want to do that to him or, or, or downplay what, what, what he's done because he's, he's one of the best to ever do it, and I, and I totally mean that. But this young player is on a different level for, for a rookie, and I think Baltimore got a chance to feel that a little bit. You know, I agree with that, Devontae. I mean, Brock Bowers, I was a big fan of him when he was with Georgia. The guy's a winner. The guy's a playmaker. Whenever the ball's thrown to him, I love his explosiveness after the catch. And uh, I feel like he's on track, you know, to be better than myself. I mean, I don't think he can, you know, dominate in the trenches the way I dominated in the trenches. But just overall, as a pass-catching tight end, I think he can surpass me in the, in many situations. I mean, he already has 15 catches, the most by any rookie of all time in their first two games as a tight end. So shout out to Brock Bowers. I'm a big fan. I can't wait to, you know, continue watching him. Well, there you go. Well, that's that's uh, pretty high praise, not only from his teammate, Devontae Adams, which you would expect to a certain degree, but what Gronkowski said there, <clears throat> excuse me, about Brock Bowers, pretty impressive. And the 15 catches, as he mentioned, most for a rookie tight end through two games. Boy, this kid is going to be fun to watch this season. 
think he saw it within the first two weeks. Uh, I I was on Bleacher Report Live for a couple of weeks telling anyone who would listen to me who plays fantasy football, draft Brock Bowers. Draft him. <laughs> draft him early. Even if you think he's over, draft him because – if you're one of those people who think that the Raiders are going to eventually trade Devonta Adams, I don't think it's going to happen. But if you're one of those people, Brock Bowers is going to be your number one pass catching option for the Raiders for the foreseeable future until they get another wide receiver, right? Even if Devonta Adams does stays, which I think he does, uh, you saw Brock Bowers and Devonta Adams work as a tandem. I call it the Adams Bowers firm. Uh, they <laughs> they work well together as long as Gardner Minshew could stay upright. Now I don't like him taking five sacks as he took last week against Baltimore, but as long as he gets some time on the pocket, uh, I think Gardner Minshew works well with with tight ends. I think we've seen it uh, in previous stops. Not so much with the Colts because the Colts don't have a, a tight end that stood out. But I think it, it, uh, there was a graphic that floated around that Gardner Minshew, his his pass uh, completion rate, his production with twelve um, with twelve personnel, two tight end sets, pretty good. And you're seeing the production with Brock Bowers right now. Yeah, and to me, you know, it, it's. <laughs> And we tried to do this, and we 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 talked uh, with with the gentleman who covered him at the Atlanta Junior Con- Journal Constitution. I forget his Chip name Towers. now. Chip Towers. Chip Towers. Thank you. <clears throat> so we talked to him, and, and 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 that's what struck me by that conversation, and made me go back and look at that time uh, during the spring at at his film from Georgia to understand that no 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 this is not a normal tight end. This is not a guy. That you just line up, which is why the Gronkowski praise makes a lot of sense because Rob Gronkowski and he mentioned he was he was also a beast at the line, which is a little bit different. And Brock Bowers, I think, can do some of that. He's it's just not known for it yet. But that in itself, he was a playmaker. And Tom Telesco, to his credit, after the draft, that's what he said right at the draft press conference. He says, listen, we're not drafting him as a tight end. We're drafting him as a playmaker. So that's very different. So when you start to look at it and I had some great conversations online with folks, Mo. That were like, well, yeah, Brock Bowers is great and all that, but where's Michael Mary? Disappear. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. These are these are different players. They have different purposes. It doesn't mean Michael Mayer doesn't play play tight end or matter in the offense, because he does. And he can, he's a good pass catcher as well. Is he the Brock Bowers type guy? No, but he can still be very good. And and that was some of the narrative I saw was well. He's taken all the snaps and now Michael Mayer doesn't get any snaps. Well, Michael Mayer only had five less snaps than Brock Bowers in the game. There's a lot of 12 personnel. People didn't really see it because they don't show it to you on TV all the time. But um, I think having Brock Bowers there eventually now, and this is where I I put here on the graphic for the show, already not a secret, you know, teams are going to get wise to this and they're going to start doubling him up a little bit, but that's going to free up everybody else, including Michael Mayer, including Devontae Adams, including Jacoby Myers and Turner, all these guys. Now, as they continue, as he continues to have success, he's getting national media all over the place, Mo. This is going to be something great for them because he's going to be a player and be able to make plays and they'll continue to go to him. But he's also going to free up the rest of that offense. I think a lot of people expected the Raiders to just go all out with 12 personnel, some absurd number like 50 (laughs) percent of the time. And that's just not the reality of it. One, because you want the speed of Trey Tucker on the field. Right. So you have to you have to juggle a lot of playmakers. So I, I think as time goes on, as the season progresses, you're going to see more 12 personnel, more Michael Mayer on the field, more Michael Mayer getting the ball. But it's clear that Brock Bowers is the primary pass catcher. I believe on draft night I said this, that Brock Bowers is going to be asked to catch the football. That's going to be his <laughs> primary thing. Now, he'll be asked to block, too, but that's going to be more Michael Mayer. He's going to be more of the traditional tight end where he may not catch the football a ton like Brock Bowers but he'll be involved on plays and blocking. So Michael Mayer's numbers are not going to look like Brock Bowers. Don't expect that. Uh, Brock Bowers is just on, an, as Gron- Rob Gronkowski said, as Devontae Adams said, Brock Bowers is just on another level. He's on another level, and and the mismatches. You saw some of this against Baltimore, right? Mm-hmm. It was a good defense. But the mismatches that are created when you line him up in different spots, that's the magic of it all, too, because he is athletic enough and he is talented enough to – play in multiple roles and play in multiple spots to create those mismatches. I mean, for Luke Getze, it's a godsend. It is. And I, and I think with Baltimore, they, they got some defensive issues. I, I don't think that's the same. Now that's not taking anything from Brock Bowers and what the Raiders did. No, but that's definitely not the same defense after losing their defense, their former defensive coordinator, Mike McDonald, who's now the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. So I think one, 
not the same defense, but the Reds were to, able to expose some of the things uh, that are ailing that Ravens defense. We saw Roquan Smith get picked on when mm-hmm. they played the Chiefs. Uh, they, the Chiefs do it a lot toward Roquan, and he got frustrated in that game. And the Raiders also targeted Roquan in coverage. So that's something that you're probably going to see going forward on the Ravens side. But I think with Brock Bowers, you're also going to see a lot more of him. I know he led the team in targets the first week, I believe. And then he uh, almost got to the end zone last week. But I think you're right, Scott. I think he gonna, he's going to get into the end zone this week because he's yeah. too good not to with all the targets and all the receiving yards that he's getting. He's going to eventually reach Pater. Yeah, and that Panthers defense. Man, I'm excited to watch this guy. I mean, he's just phenomenal. It's going to be fun to see. And that connection obviously started to get really good between him and Minshew last week, and I think we'll see that continue uh, on Sunday here with the Panthers. All right, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, guess what? It's going to be time to hear from you. That's right, on Silver and Black today, it's the Raider Nation mailbag. We're going to get to your calls, inundated with calls. So if you don't hear your call today, don't worry. We'll carry some over. We'll get to them. But we certainly appreciate you guys calling in. It is Scott. It is Mo. This is Silver and Black Today. Don't go anywhere. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from From you. Many Oakland Raider fans, Las Vegas Raider fans, stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. Black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right, we're going to get through these quick. Thanks for being with us, by the way. Again, 702-900-7869. Silver and Black Today. Odyssey Sports Original Podcast, also 101.5 FM, KDON in Las Vegas, as well as 89.5. Trouble with my numbers today. The bet in Las Vegas. So thanks for being with us. We're going to jump right in to our calls, Mo. You ready? You got your chin strap on? You ready to go? (laughs) Ready like Brock Bowers. Here we go. Oh, it's Jacob. This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? Uh, yeah. So midweek, midweek now. You know, it's still victory week, right? But we're on, as Bill Belichick would say, we're on to Cincinnati. But we're on to Carolina. <laughs> we're on to the Panthers. We're on to uh, Bryce Young. That guy can't. Wait a second. It's not Bryce Young. It's Andy Dalton. It's the Red Rifle. It's the 4-0 and against the Las Vegas slash Oakland Raiders. Red Rifle Andy Dalton. What are we ever to do? Well, <laughs> let me tell you something, guys. We got a different defense this time around. So there's that to look forward to. I don't think we're going to have too many problems going up against Andy Dalton. I don't want to, you know, sleep on him. He's a good veteran quarterback. But at the end of the day, that's what he's going to be remembered as. He's just an okay veteran quarterback and i'll be i'll be durned i'll be gosh durned if the raiders start their opening opener their their home opener in vegas against the red rifle and come in with an l we're not gonna let that happen that's just not gonna happen now i wanted to talk to you guys about you know the guy with the glasses from last week like coast intolerant, the copier <laughs> scam. You know that guy. He told me about you know the eleven to twelve percent chance possibility of making it to the playoffs when you go zero and two. Well, I just got the numbers crunched back from the guy with the glasses, and he told me when a team starts one and one, their teams historically have a forty-two to forty-five percent chance of making it to the playoffs afterwards. It's not as good as starting two and zero, obviously, because you got about a sixty to sixty-five percent chance. But it's a lot better than starting zero and two. We started off five hundred. Now we want to try and get above there, and this is a perfect week. What do we got to do, Scott and Mo? You let me know. You take it easy. Go. There you go, Jacob. With more impressions. Thanks for the call, Jacob. Yeah, Andy Dalton, Mo, you talked about it all throughout the last two shows, actually, that, that you expect their offense to do more there, which is fine. I think the, the bottom line with this one comes down to Raiders executing, Raiders not turning the ball over. Of course. And, you you know, you want to win the turnover battle. But as far as what the Raiders have to do, 
fine 17, fine 89 downfield. Uh, start mm-hmm. there and then work on and also work on your run game. While even if Devonta Adams and, and Brock Bowers are cooking, I still think it's important for the Raiders to find their run game. Get Samir White, get Samir White and or Alexander Madison going before you face some tougher defenses because you're going to you're going to eventually need that balance because again oh, yeah. teams are going to teams are going to adjust to what you're doing and if you if the Raiders change their philosophy a bit and become a pass first team you're going to see more three safety looks you're going to see more dime looks so you you want to be able to adjust and get and get the run game going uh just so you can have that balance all right, there you go. Thanks for the call again. Now we're going to go for a text. Our good buddy Mark in Boyle Heights down in Los Angeles says he just wants to see what both of us think regarding how the schedule looks two weeks in. In my opinion, there are some injuries and underperforming teams that looked like definitive losses before week one that now look like winnable games. Rams and Dolphins could like could look like wins if the Raiders played like they did versus Baltimore. Brown's offensive line seems to be an issue and Watson doesn't look any better and the Steelers look very beatable. Has the total wins shifted after this week to win? Thank you guys for the hard work. Go Raiders. Again, that's Mark in Boyle Heights. Mo, your seven win prediction change at all? It was eight and nine. I know. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but this is why I don't... Nation fired up at you. This is why I don't... This is why I tell fans not to get too work, worked up over... Predictions. And predictions because right. one injury chain can change a lot. Like, okay, the Miami Dolphins, I talked about this a lot during the offseason. I said, mm-hmm. if the Miami Dolphins are healthy, then they're going to be tough because they're a high-scoring football team. But I also said if Tua gets hurt, then it's a different football game. Well, lo and behold, Tua so unfortunately suffered his third documented concussion. That team is totally different with Skylar Thompson under center. Who? If you look at the schedule, uh, our guy just mentioned it, the Rams – they both of their starting wide receivers are out. Puka Nakua can miss five to seven weeks. Cooper Cup has had ankle injuries. He's gonna miss. He's gonna miss time on IR. That game now looks very different for the Rams. So injuries change a lot. The Buccaneers look better than I thought they would. The the Falcons coming back over the Eagles. <laughs> they could catch some steam now. The Raiders see them on Monday Night Football. Kirk Cousins has won four of his last five games. On Monday Night mm-hmm. Football, so we need to kill the narrative that he doesn't play well on Monday Night Football. He's won four of his last five. Yeah. So my point here is this is why we make off-season predictions, but take it with a grain of salt because with an injury, with a trade, with a with a guy getting hurt or benched, it could all change. You take it week by week. Yeah, and I would also offer to your point, Mo, that while some of those teams, he's right, the Miami, Cleveland, that kind of stuff – like you said, there's teams that counterbalance that that you thought were winnable before yeah. that might be tougher, like New Orleans, like Atlanta, right? Like Tampa Bay. Those the are Saints. all more. Scott, yeah, the, the Saints. Saints, the Saints are scoring at will. The Saints yeah. scored on their first 15 possessions with Derek Carr in the center. The Saints look Who? like the best. They look like the best team in the league with Derek Carr on the center. That yes. Saints game now at the end of the year. Could be big if the Raiders are in the playoff hunt and the Saints are trying to win the NFC South. Yeah, that game could be huge for the Raiders and the Saints. Ah, that's easy. Well, we'll see. Thought was easy, but it's gonna be tough. All right, Mark and Boyle Heights, thank you for the text message. Now we go out to Pastor Mike behind bars. Scott Mo, Pastor Mike behind bars. I'm on the road today, and or I'm actually in Western Oregon. And I got meetings with the chaplains this week. And but anyway, I wanted to just kind of put my two cents in on, on the Ravens game. Um, I, yeah, I didn't expect them to win the game. I was stoked that they won the game. A couple of things that I noticed. Um, it seems like the left side of the offensive line is worse than the right side, or is it me? Um, so, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously we need help there. That will help the running game. Brock Bowers is the man. <laughs> they were right to get the, you know, to take him at 13. I don't care what anybody says. The guy's going to be a baller, man. And Max, well, Max is Max. So here we are, one and one, and on to the next one. Bring the Panthers on with Andy Dalton starting. That should be interesting. All right, man, I just thought I'd just drop in and, and give you a few comments. You guys have a great week. We'll talk to you after next week's game. Raiders. All right, there's Pastor Mike doing the Lord's work behind bars. We appreciate you calling in 
And uh, yeah, I mean, look, the left side of the line versus the right side. I see issues on both Mo. I, I understand what he's saying because I think, I think th the fact that Colton Miller has really struggled through two weeks is a surprise for people. So that's maybe why Pastor Mike thinks that, thinks that way. I actually agree with me. I think the left side of the line is a bigger problem than the right side. I think the left side, particularly in pass protection, I think Ooh. left side hasn't been well, it hasn't played well in either phase, pass Correct. or run blocking. With the right side of the line, it's pretty it has been pretty good in pass blocking with the Thea Mumford had struggled last week. But in the first week, Thea Mumford played well, had pretty good in pass pro, and so was Dylan Parham. They struggled in run block. Mm. So that that's that I think that's the differentiation between the left and the right side. The left side is not doing anything well, <laughs> and the right side is actually pass blocking well. If the right side can get the run blocking right, then then you know it's it's good for the half of the offensive line. There you go, Pastor Mike. Thanks. Now we're going all the way down to South Florida. South Florida Raider joins us. Hey, this is South Florida Raider calling about that Minshew Minshew baby. <laughs> Great win for the Raiders yeah. on Sunday. Minshew gets it done in the fourth. I never really questioned myself whether we should throw O'Connor in the game. I always thought it was a Ketsky problem, not a Minshew problem. Too many conservative play calls, too many screen plays, trying to make up for the lack of running attack that we have. <clears throat> However, when I look at the lack of running game that we have, I associate it also with the fact that we're running 100% of the time from the shotgun formation. I haven't seen the Raiders run under center at all. <clears throat> but some of the best running plays that you could have come from under center. Let me know your thoughts on that. On another note, tight end Mark Bowers, phenomenal game. We needed him to get off to a fast start, especially with our previous first round draft history. So many people in the media saying that they don't know how we were going to use them. Uh, it was a waste of a draft pick. Glad to see the big fella get off to a nice start, beating all tight ends and receiving. Real quick. Just like Mo, I grew up watching Jeff Hosteller. Um, I'm 43 years old. My favorite Raiders are Charles Woodson, Here we go. Terrence McDaniel, and Rich Cannon. There you go. Just a little bit about me. South Florida Raider out. All right. South Florida Raider, thanks for representing the Sunshine State so well. I love it. Eight, 80s, baby. Representing 80s. Rich Cannon. You youngsters. <laughs> Rich Cannon, Jeff Hosteller, that's that Charles Woodson, that's that's our era. That's when we came up watching the Raiders. So it's good to hear someone else in my age group kind of share the same lens of growing up a Raider fan. But to get to the question in the in the call, uh, maybe that's one of the things that Antonio Pierce may want to change. Because Antonio Pierce, as I said, talked about it Monday. If they have to change some things with the steam to get Zamir White going, so be it. Uh, maybe running on the center is one of those things. But I, as I point back to, again, the – zone blocking scheme that Luke Getze brought in versus the gap blocking scheme that was there previously. I think that was, that's one of the primary things that may need to change if you want to get Zamir White going. And that's, and it's also probably why Alexander Madison has been able to get more yards per touch mm. than Zamir White uh, when it comes to the running back position out of the backfield. Yes. I appreciate the call. Southfire. Okay. We got to hurry up and get this final call in. This is Raider Loke. Raider Loke. What is up, Scott and Mo and the rest of Raider Nation that's tuning in? There we go. This is Raider Loke from the 626. Well, Scott and Mo, we got that win against Baltimore on Sunday. And uh, let's just say um, I called at an early night that day. Um, no, I did not uh, pass out uh, <laughs> from drinking. I actually was not drinking that day. Um, but I called it an early night. Uh, I actually called, I had a late day Saturday. Uh, Early day Sunday, obviously for a 10 a.m. kickoff. So um, yeah, uh, I, um, sorry to bore you with the details, but yeah, we got that win, and um, yeah, we kind of sell of uh, two halves. Uh, first half, uh, kind of repeat of last week, trying to get the run game going. We couldn't get it going, though. So the O line wasn't blocking for nothing. So in the second half, we decided to go with the pass uh, first, and I believe uh, going forward, that's something that um, uh, AP and Luke Getzi got to got to. Uh, got to discuss and that uh, change going forward with as far as the team. Um, I do recall AP uh, having a face to face with yes, he right before halftime, and I think they were talking about making some adjustments, and that's what happened. So, you know, I say that to say that last season, you know, we had a solidified O line going to the second year. Uh, uh, consistency is kind of what you call Mo. So I get it. You know, Josh, you had Josh Jacobs. Uh, so I get it. You know, going in and then AP try to repeat what he had last season as far as a uh, run first team and. We ain't having it. We got Greg James. I believe he's a new online coach. We got a zone blocking scheme. Uh, Amir White is trying to get a hang of the zone blocking scheme. And 
with all that being said, we don't have the same playmakers as last year. So let's try changing it up a bit. You know, instead of being a run first team, let's go with the pass first team. And then maybe that opened them to run and you look what happened. And exactly what happened in the second half. And let's see if that changes going forward. But um, I know this week uh, we got the Panthers. I'll be at the season home opener. Uh, home opener, should I say, will be my fourth consecutive time going since 2021. Nice. Against the Eagles, the Patriots, the Steelers, and then now the Carolina Panthers. I'll be two and, I'm 2-1. Hopefully we get that win, but I'm not worried. I know the, uh, they're starting Andy Dalton uh, over benching of Bryce Young, and I know he's undefeated against us at the moment. But at the end of the day, we got Marvin Lewis, assistant head coach, who's been head, uh, Andy Dalton's uh, head coach for his, most of his career. So I'm not really worried about it. I'm pretty sure we'll be prepared for this game. Let's hope they make some uh, changes on offense and let's see how this goes. But um, that's all I got to say. Looking forward to uh, the game. This is Raider Lowe, and I'm out. Wow, Raider Loke got a lot. Of, let me tell you something, Raider Loke. I don't know how many cups of coffee you had before that call, but, <laughs> but he got it all in. <laughs> he got it, dude. He got it all in, and that was pretty impressive. We only got a few left here, Mo, but uh, made some great points there. He's going to be hey, he's two and one in openers uh, for Raider Nation's sake. Hope he's three and one now, Mo. Real quick prediction on the game here. Uh, what do you got for the Raiders? What's the score? Raider Lowe's going to be there, so I, I, I'm going Raiders 27 to Ooh. 20. Wow, yes, there you go. 27 to 20. All right. I got, I, I'm having, I'm saying 24 to 13. I think the defense shows out and they win this one by 11. Hopefully, we'll see what happens. But anyway. Oh, that's going to do it. Our time is up as we are ready to check out of here. Mo, uh, let everybody know what you got coming up here uh, real quick before we hit the the the, sk- the streets, if you will. <laughs> Over on Sportsnet, what has to change, the scheme or the running back? Well, I'll, mm. I'll discuss that, break it down. Is Alexander Madison the new RB1, or is it time to change the scheme to fit Zamir White? Uh, if, you tu- oh, if you're going to tune in, if you have your TV, if you're near a TV today, TNT Sports Tonight with Coy Wire may stick a Raiders topic in there. Who knows? And, of course, on Sunday after the game, I will be on live Bleach Report. As soon as the final whistle is done, chat with me, talk with me. Let's have a talk about the Raiders. Hopefully a W. Yes, that's right. We appreciate it. Make sure you watch Mo there. We will be live here as well on Silver and Black today over on the YouTube channel. Make sure you check it out after the game. Me and Murph from Raiders Fan Radio will be there. And uh, you can also catch that on the audio version. If you don't catch the video right after the game, you can catch the audio version usually within about 45 minutes after the game. And the show is over and it'll be up on the podcast feed. All right, Mo, I will see you next week, my friend. Take care, Scott. Take care, Raider Nation. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for our executive producer on radio, Mark Bonilla, and for Mo Mo, and I am Scott Colbranson. Special shout out to our good friends at BetUS for bringing this video to you today as well. Thank you, guys. And we'll see you all next week.